Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of the 24th of September 2020 today. It's uh, uh, my pleasure uh, with together with Sebastian Geiger, my friend and colleague at Heriot Wack University, to uh, host you yet with uh, another uh, keynote speak uh, and, and lecture this week. Uh, we are pleased to have you all here and also those who follow us uh, afterwards uh, due to their time conflicting uh, schedule and uh, for uh, having you all subscribing and combat uh, the work from home isolation everywhere you are. Uh, please do subscribe to the channel. It would help you get through uh, the uh, notifications of the upcoming talks. At the same time, you could easily uh, go through the past uh, talks in the case you have missed any. Also, there is a Tea Time talk series uh, run by uh, junior researchers for junior researchers and, of course, uh, more senior as well, uh, especially if you're a PhD candidate or postdoc researcher, try to connect with them and also uh, broaden your network, present, volunteer to present your work as well. Without uh, further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our uh, keynote speaker of this week. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Professor Miles Allen from the University of Oxford here. Uh, is with us this week. Uh, Miles, uh, Miles is head of the Climate Dynamics Group at the University of Oxford's Atmospheric, Oceanic and Planetary Physics Department. He's the principal investigator of the distributed computing project climateprediction.net, which makes use of computing resources provided uh, voluntarily by the general public and was the principal responsible person for starting this project as well. He's professor of geosystem science in the School of Geography and the Environment and a fellow of Lineker College at Oxford. He has worked at the energy unit of the UN Environment Program, the Roth Ford Appleton Lab and MIT. He was a coordinating lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special Report on 1.5 degrees centigrade, having previously also served on the IPCC's third, fourth, and fifth assessments, including the Synthetic um, Synthesis uh, Report co-writing team in 2014. His research focuses on the attribution of recent climate change and assessing what these changes mean for global climate simulations of the future. In 2010, Allen was awarded the Edward Appleton Medal and Prize by the Institute of Physics for, I'm quoting, his important contributions to the detection and attribution of human influence on climate and quantifying uncertainty in climate predictions. Allen also provided the technical expertise for the game Fate of the World, which is a PC strategy game that simulates the real social and environmental impact of global climate change over the next 200 years. Also, it is mentioned, we did some search about him in 2015. He has mentioned, apparently, uh, Miles, you have now, you can confirm that carbon capture and storage should be made mandatory. So it's our pleasure and honor to have you, Miles, here with us this week. To the audience, please note my lecture would uh, last for about 30 minutes, followed by questions and discussions. Like before, please type in uh, your questions in the chat room and Sebastian will go through them and uh, chair the discussion session. Uh, please do not wait until the end of uh, my uh, lecture. Whenever you feel appropriate, please do feel free and most welcome to post your question. It may also trigger other questions as well. Uh, without any further ado, I would like to give the bandwidth, the screen uh, to Miles. It's our pleasure. Thank you once more for accepting our invitation, please. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Hadi, for that introduction. And uh, uh, I, I, I don't know where you got all that information from, but I'd really like to pick up on that, the last point you mentioned, which is something I've been advocating for um, over a decade now. And because this is a geoscience and geoenergy seminar series, uh, this will, I, I'll sort of start off with some geoscience, but I'll mainly get onto a geoenergy question, which is how do we actually achieve net zero, particularly how do we do it by decarbonizing fossil fuels? This is what I've argued for, for some years now, 
which is that we won't get to net zero uh, by decarbonizing the economy or by decarbonizing activities. We actually have to decarbonize fossil fuels themselves in order to meet this objective. So let's just start off by giving this in context that the overall net zero challenge, uh, what we're trying to do, these are three figures from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change special reports on 1.5 degrees, which really summarize uh, the challenge before us and the timescales which we have left to act in if we want to meet the goals set out in the Paris Climate Agreement. First of all, this is the first figure which illustrates the point that human-induced warming has already reached 1.1 degrees. Paris set the goal of limiting warming to well below two degrees and pursuing efforts to limit the warming to 1.5 degrees. We're already at 1.1 degree and warming at 0.2 degrees, possibly more than 0.2 degrees per decade. So it, it, you don't need a climate model to work out that we're going to be reaching 1.5 degrees within the next couple of decades. And the report stressed that if we want to stop the warming, even, even if we want to halt the warming for a few decades, we need to reach net zero carbon dioxide emissions. What that means is that every ton of carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere has to be actively removed from the atmosphere to reach net zero because natural sinks of carbon dioxide are too weak to remove it for us. And we need no further warming from other climate forcing agents, uh, things like methane or aerosols. So um, we've got, we haven't got long to do this. We've got about 40 years to halt the warming if we're to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, um, but only if we hit the brakes now. Again, this is just, it, it may be helpful to you when you're explaining to your friends how this all works, who may be suspicious of climate models, of long-term climate projections. This isn't a model-based result. This is just simply follows from basic geometry about how fast we're warming now and how fast we therefore need to decelerate if we're to limit the warming to 1.5 degrees. It's exactly analogous to a braking time, which I'm sure you all learned about when you were doing your driving lessons. If you've got two seconds before you reach a junction, then you've got four seconds to stop if you stop immediately, if you start stopping immediately. Um, if it's 20 years before we reach 1.5 degrees, then we've got 40 years to stop the warming if we want to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees, but only if we start now. Every year we delay, we lose potentially two years of time left to stop the warming. Again, it's back to the simple fact that the, the longer you put off decelerating, the faster you have to hit the brakes, the harder you have to hit the brakes if you want to stop in time. So on current trends, as I said, we'll reach 1.5 degrees before 2040. So we need to be um, stopping the warming well before 2060 if we're going to meet that 1.5 degree goal. One of the next, the next question, the 1.5 degrees. Uh, so the first question we were asked in this 1.5 degrees report is, you know, can we still limit warming to 1.5 degrees? Is it geophysically possible? The answer is it is, but it's clearly going to need very rapid um, and unprecedented action. Um, the other question we were asked is, is it, is it worth it? Um, does it make any difference limiting warming to 1.5 degrees versus two degrees? And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this one. That would be another entire talk in itself. Um, but I wanted to highlight a couple of things that the report did stress about emerging climate risks. Um, two areas uh, in unique and threatened systems, systems like coral reefs, um, which are already under stress from the climate change we've already seen so far, and in changing extreme weather events, we're already in the orange zone. That's right, well, that means we're already seeing a moderate change, moderate increase in risk and impact due to warming to date. The gray band here shows you warming, the, the, the level of warming we were at in the decade prior to the Paris Agreement. Of course, we've gone above that now because we're warming at over 0.2 degrees per decade. As we move up in both of these indicators, we move into the red zone. And um, that's when we're starting to see high risks to both um, unique and threatened systems like coral reefs and also uh, substantial changes in extreme weather events which affect us all. 
Um, but the one I'd really like to focus on, which is one of the reasons why I think we there will be overwhelming pressure to stop the warming in the coming decades, is this um, risk of distribute what's called distribution of impacts, but it's really distributional effects, the impact of unequal impacts on different countries. And one of the key findings of the report was that um, we found that um, the, the, the economic impacts of a warming between 1.5 and 2 degrees were disproportionately experienced by countries in the tropics. These are countries that um, are already, in many cases, experiencing heat stress for significant portions of the year. They're countries that have contributed often very little to the climate change problem to date, and yet these are the countries whose economic performance is adversely, particularly adversely affected by additional warming. So these are the, you know, I can see this as becoming a, a substantial destabilizing influence in geopolitics as the countries that have contributed least to the problem start to feel themselves most adversely affected. So the pressure for solutions is only going to grow. And the next question we have to ask is, what will it take to, for us to actually limit warming to 1.5 degrees? And on this, um, again, the report found that there are still multiple pathways available to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, but they involve a choice. We either have to immediately reduce demand for energy and energy intensive products, or commit ourselves to very large scale, permanent, and that by permanent, that means geological disposal of carbon dioxide later on in this century. I'll just draw your attention to one aspect of this, um, this figure. The, the gray bands in these figures, this, shows, these, this figure shows you four scenarios, pathways they're called, to, that each succeed in limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. And the gray is the production of carbon dioxide from fossil fuels and industry, which as you see has to go down very rapidly, but doesn't itself go down to zero. But by mid-century, we reach net zero emissions by compensating for our remaining fossil fuel emissions, those small remaining fossil fuel emissions in uh, the first three scenarios at least, by active removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through land use change in brown um, and through active disposal of carbon dioxide back underground, geological carbon dioxide storage in yellow. And as you can see, the brown contributes something, um, but the, the overwhelming focus we tend to see in policy circles at the moment on uh, what you might call tree planting, things like the, the World Economic Forum's Trillion Trees campaign and so on. Um, I'm not against tree planting. I think it's a great, it's a great thing. It can provide a great service. Um, but you know, you, you can't, it's not that obvious on these figures. It's, it's not the solution to climate change that some people have hoped it to be. So let's just zoom in on these scenarios a bit uh, closer. This shows the P1 and P4 scenarios. And one of the things we see in all of these scenarios is the fastest rate at which these so-called integrated assessment models, these are economic models of the Earth's climate and eco economy system, the, the fastest rates that they assess we can reduce emissions are roughly the same. You see, either we reduce emissions very rapidly now, or we wait a decade or so, and then we reduce emissions very rapidly. But in all cases, um, the, the models agree that we can't reduce emissions faster than um, a, around 2 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year per year. And as a result, we are limited in how fast we can stop the warming, how, you know, how strong the brakes are, so to speak, in that breaking time analogy. And what this means is that every ton of carbon dioxide that is dumped into the atmosphere before we begin reductions, and despite the blip caused by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, we are still seeing emissions globally going up. Um, every ton we dump in the atmosphere before reductions begin is a ton that will have to be scrubbed out again 
before 2100 if we're to meet our climate goals. So that's the challenge we have before us. And to understand you know, what, we're, you know, what we have to do about it, uh, we need to sort of focus in exactly on what's causing it and think of some numbers. So I'll sort of get onto some numbers now. Um, this is the, the origin of that statement that we're now at 1.1 degrees. If you go to globalwarmingindex.org, you can see where the numbers come from. And the orange line here shows you the human contribution to warming to date. The black dots are just monthly temperatures. And as you can see, between the human contribution and the natural contributions shown here in blue, we can pretty much explain uh, the, the decadal variations in temperature that we've seen over the past century. And most, or in fact, all of the warming we've seen to date is attributable to the increase in greenhouse gases due to human activity. So that's the orange line there. Breaking that down a bit further, if we zoom in on that human-induced warming in orange, we can break it down into the contribution from carbon dioxide emissions in dark gray, and then the contribution from other climate drivers uh, in pale gray. And you can see that carbon dioxide is of the order of uh, three quarters to 80% or so of the warming to date. Which brings us to a, a nice rule that I liked, uh, the late uh, David Mackay um, was, was, uh, gave us the great uh, quote, uh, I'm not trying to be pro-nuclear, I'm just pro-arithmetic. Um, so uh, I really love his book, Without the Hot Air, um, Renewable Energy Without the Hot Air. And uh, he gave us a great lesson in you know, thinking about sort of simple um, expressions that allow us to understand what's most important. Um, in addressing a big issue like global warming. So I'm giving, going to give you one of those simple expressions for you to think about. Um, and this is you know, the warming we see in the future, or over any time interval, but let's say it's between now and the date of peak warming, is given by this constant, the transient climate response to emissions, which is roughly 0.4 degrees per trillion tons of CO2, multiplying the total amount of carbon dioxide emitted over that time interval. So that's this uh, uh, emissions of carbon dioxide term. And then the change in global energy balance, imbalance due to other drivers of climate divided by this normalization factor, which has a value in this sort of standard units we use of about one, one watt per square meter per trillion tons of carbon. So to stop global warming, we need to stop dumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. There's no way we can do this unless we stop dumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And there are only two ways to stop dumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This is where I sort of graduate from geoscience to geoenergy, if you like. One of them is an effective global ban on fossil fuel extraction and use. And the other is an alternative, safe, and permanent means of disposing of carbon dioxide not dumping it into the atmosphere. Um, so I, I put it to you, those are the only two options available. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the idea of a ban, although it's implicit in many scenarios for how we actually address global warming in integrated assessment models. Sometimes it's not called a ban. Sometimes it's called a $1,000 per ton of CO2 carbon price. But if you think about what that's actually doing when the carbon price gets that high, it's not really a carbon price. It's not a, it's not a price that people are paying to emit. It's a fine people are paying for the crime of still emitting. So it is, in effect, a ban. A lot of people take the idea of a ban on fossil fuel use quite seriously. We had a report from the University of Cambridge last year which, in, which, which mapped out a path to absolute zero by 2050. And if you look carefully at this figure, you can see the things that, that the changes that have to happen for us to succeed in um, ab achieving absolute zero by 2050. This is for the UK. In the 2030s, we need all remaining airports in the UK to close. We need all shipping to decline to zero. We need fossil fuels to be completely phased out. That's what it'll take to reach an absolute zero UK. And it's you know, a sobering possibility 
that some people are still some people still think that this is the way we will do it. Others sort of say, oh well, we'll just put a price on carbon and that'll solve the problem. But as we pointed out in the 1.5 degrees report, and that was what the New York Times was reporting on um, in this headline, um, in order to stop, in order to reach net zero, in order to stop the flow of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere entirely, you need the price on carbon to go very, very high indeed, thousands of dollars per tonne of, of carbon dioxide. Right now, you know, most carbon prices are down at the level of, you know, a few dollars per tonne of CO2, or maybe 10 or 20 at most. And even um, a sort of price at the range of $12 per tonne of CO2 was uh, what triggered the Gilets Jaunes protests in France. The bottom line is that people are prepared to pay a surprising amount for fossil fuels. Um, this is a, 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 a quite a poignant picture of a village in Greece where they discovered their village was built on a deposit of lignite, a particularly dirty form of brown coal. Um, and they, they literally dug out the ground underneath the village, leaving only the church standing in order to get out the lignite, uh, which shows the, the level of carbon price people are prepared to pay. They're literally prepared to dig out the ground from under their own feet to get hold of fossil carbon. I mentioned before that many people like to talk about nature-based climate solutions. This was the big um, story in the World Economic Forum earlier this year. But if you think about it, storing carbon in trees is neither safe nor permanent. For many years, countries like Norway were paying Brazil to store their carbon for them in Amazonia. But we've seen since the Bolsonaro government got in in Brazil, a complete reversal of Amazonian uh, deforestation trends, which of course is very sad um, for global biodiversity for all sorts of reasons, but it also means that that carbon, which was supposed to be being stored in Amazonia, is being re-released back into the atmosphere. And we can quantify the potential of nature-based climate solutions. This is a, a figure from a paper we have, we're working on at the moment, um, which, which is um, uh, uh, under, under review at the moment, which shows that you know, the maximum that you could expect nature to mop up between now and mid-century might reduce global temperatures by perhaps a tenth of a degree. So that's not to be sneezed at, that's a useful contribution, but at a time when fossil fuel emissions are driving up global temperatures by two tenths of a degree per decade, um, you've got to keep this sort of solution into context. And as I say, the irony was that at the World Economic Forum, there was much more time spent talking about planting trees than there was being talking about fossil fuel emissions. So we need to stop fossil fuels from causing global warming. We've got the ban or we've got safe and permanent disposal of all the carbon dioxide generated by fossil fuels. So what do I mean by safe and permanent disposal? Well, um, planting trees isn't permanent. It's got to be re-injected back into the Earth's crust. If we uh, release carbon from rocks, we've got to put it back there. Um, so permanent disposal means re-injection of carbon dioxide back into the Earth's crust. Um, this brings us to the idea of a carbon take-back obligation, which is a way of achieving net zero, um, not by changing actively changing the economy or changing the activities that we do, but in effect by going upstream to achieve net zero by decarbonizing fossil fuels themselves. And the way this would work is that anyone selling fossil fuels would have to certify that a prescribed fraction of carbon dioxide generated by those fuels, including the use of those fuels, was permanently and safely disposed of. Now that fraction has to reach 100% for the world to reach net zero. Um, that's just what net zero means, but it doesn't have to be 100% straight away. But what we do know is that on average, it has to increase. Right now, the fraction of carbon dioxide that we sequester is typically zero. So we know how fast it has to increase over the next 30 years. If we want to get to net zero by 2050, 
then the net fraction of carbon dioxide that we sequester has to increase by 3.3% per year for the next 20 years, for the next 30 years. That's, you know, that's by definition what it will take to achieve net zero. That's not a scenario, that's just mathematics. Um, now, of course, we could discuss how fast we need to increase this uh, fraction initially um, compared to how fast we have to increase it later on. Um, and a sort of reasonable pathway might take us to 10% by 2030, 50% by 2040, 100% by 2050. We'll come back to the costs in a minute. So what does this look like? Well, here's a bunch of scenarios. Let's focus on the blue lines to start with. These are those classic integrated assessment model scenarios um, that keep temperatures to 1.5 degrees in dark blue or well below two degrees in light blue. And as you can see, the 1.5 degree scenarios, they, they all head down towards zero around mid-century. Um, but that doesn't come from reducing the amount of carbon dioxide we produce from uh, fossil fuels and energy intensive industries. That goes down in many scenarios only by about 50%. That's panel B, the top lines in panel B, but it's balanced by very large amounts of carbon dioxide being re-injected into the Earth's crust, being sequestered back underground. Now, the red lines here show what happens if you impose this sequestered fraction, if you require fossil fuel producers to bury an increasing fraction of the fossil carbon that they generate, uh, and that is generated by the products they sell. Um, the shape of the red lines are suggested by panel C here. Uh, by the way, I should, should have mentioned that all of these figures uh, the, the, in, the, in the latest set of slides are from a figure, uh, from a paper under consideration uh, led by my colleague, Stuart Jenkins. Um, so you can see in the left, in panel C here, the left panel here, this shows you the fraction of carbon that is re-injected back into the Earth's crust as a function of time in all of these scenarios. And as you can see, it has to reach 100% to reach net zero. That's what net zero means. And it's now at zero, so it has to go up. And it does go up, and it goes up reasonably smoothly following something like a quadratic profile um, to reach 100% around mid-century. So the red line is just a hypothetical scenario in which instead of running a, a, an economic model and letting the amount of sequestration emerge from the carbon price and the choices of technologies and so on in that model, it's actually imposed. So we say by 2030, we need to be sequestering 10%. By 2040, we need to be sequestering 50%. By 2050, 100%. What then happens to emissions? And of course, that, uh, you know, so you can see you get a, a very smooth up, uh, increase in the sequestered fraction. If I go back to this figure, you can see what happens to emissions depends, of course, on how much we still produce. We're sequestering an ever increasing fraction, but what's the denominator? What's the, what's the, uh, what's the numerator here? Um, how much are we still producing? And if we don't reduce our our production of carbon dioxide at all, if we just carry on burning carbon at the current rate, which is the dashed line here, then we actually have to bury a huge amount of CO2 by mid-century, more than double um, the maximum rate of CO2 burial that we see um, in these integrated assessment model scenarios. Um, but if we uh, instead reduce our, our production down to half the current level, which take, keep, keeps us within the um, integrated assessment model uh, scenarios, then we need to be sequestering a much more manageable, sort of roughly uh, 18 to 20 uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide per year, which is still going to be a big stretch. But um, if, if it was, you know, if we started work on that process now, then uh, it would be it would be technically feasible. So um, the the really interesting part of this is when you actually look at what this would cost. So um, if I, that's um, illustrated in these figures, maybe I could just start off with um, the numbers, um, the economics of, of carbon take back. So suppose disposing of carbon dioxide costs, say, uh, $50 per tonne of CO2 initially, 
for assuming the carbon dioxide can be captured at clean sources like refinery gas or or, or um, uh, gas produced uh, at uh, ammonia ammonia plants and these kind of things. That's relatively easy to capture, to compress, uh, and to re-inject into the Earth's crust. Um, of course, by the time we get to net zero, those sources will all have been captured. So there won't be any of that kind of carbon dioxide left. We'll have to resort to recapturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, um, which is going to be, you know, primary, well, so, so using direct air capture, which will be substantially more expensive. It's estimated in the region of sort of uh, two to 200 to $600 per ton, ton of CO2. Um, so that gives us a, a range um, of, of costs of disposing of carbon dioxide. But crucially, we're not requiring the industry to dispose of 100% of the carbon dioxide generated by their products right away. Because we're starting off at 1%, you can multiply that $50 by um, a, by, you can multiply that $50 um, by uh, uh, point, by, uh, by, you can divide it by 100, and you come up with just 50 cents. And at 15%, it's roughly $12 and so on, because as you, as you sort of increase the fraction smoothly of the more expensive carbon, that's why you end up with these numbers. And we, of course, finally reach $250 per ton of CO2 um, when we reach 100% in the 2050s, but we don't have to go there right away. And that means if we look at the cost per ton of CO2, um, which I showed you here, yep, the, the sort of equivalent carbon price, you can see it's lower than the carbon prices in many of these integrated assessment model scenarios all the way out to 2050. Um, and, you know, comparable to the others even then. So it's a, you know, by, by this sort of upstream approach to decarbonizing fossil fuels potentially gives us a route to net zero, which is substantially more cost-effective, um, more uh, and involves substantially uh, less disruption to the global economy than conventional carbon price-based paths. So I've stressed the, uh, the economics. The economics look even more surprising if you um, talk about it in terms of, um, you know, dollars per barrel. Um, and it's just, just converting, converting the... Um, uh, I think the current oil price has gone up again, but you know it's it's it gyrates around. Um, yes, requiring oil companies to dispose of their carbon dioxide um, is will of course make their product more expensive, but it won't make it unrecognizable. Um, so it would allow consumers to adapt gradually to the rising fossil fuel prices rather than um, having their having those changes imposed upon them. So let's just think about, you know, how this could work. Well, we could just have a group of countries impose, for example, a, a sort of North Sea alliance, um, both the Netherlands, uh, the uh, Norway, and uh, uh, the UK um, have a shared interest in developing the North Sea as a carbon dioxide disposal facility, uh, because we're going to need it. Um, and of course, it's, it's a shared resource between these three countries. Um, and we can impose a licensing condition on anyone selling fossil fuels that a certain fraction of the carbon dioxide generated by those fuels has been geologically sequestered. And that fraction has to rise. Um, in order for us to get to net zero, it has to rise by 3.3% per year from now on. We can argue about how much slower it rises initially, but you can't argue about the 3.3% per year on average because that's what it's going to take to get to 100% by 2050. Um, this nearly happened back in 2015. Um, the uh, Ron Oxborough, Lord Oxborough, introduced an amendment to the energy bill in 2015 that stated, within one year of this act coming into force, the Secretary of State shall undertake a consultation on measures requiring extractors and importers of petroleum to contribute to the development of carbon capture and storage. They managed to lobby it out that time. Um, the oil and gas industry pulled out the stops and made sure that that sentence did not appear in the final version of the energy bill. But I think we're seeing a bit of a change of heart in the oil and gas industry. Both BP and Shell, not quite so clearly, but BP has certainly come out with a commitment uh, 
to net zero by 2050, including the CO2 generated by the products they sell. And um, Shell is sort of inching its way towards uh, a similar commitment. Um, for these companies, they're going to need a regulation like this because they can't afford to deliver that on their own. They're going to need a regulatory framework that requires everyone selling fossil fuels to do the same. So perhaps if this were introduced today, and we are hoping that interest in this idea is starting to, re to, 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 to emerge again, um, it, would be a, it, would, it would actually you know, it would be seen to be in the long-term interests of the fossil fuel industries. So we might, we might be, be luckier the second time around. But I'll look forward to hearing your questions on this because it's, uh, it's, quite a, it's, it's a rather different way of approaching the climate change problem to uh, the one which you, you're probably most familiar with. Uh, but in the end, I believe this sort of approach is the only one that's ultimately going to be effective. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miles, for the very interesting uh, talk. Uh, I would like to hand over to Sebastian for uh, question parts. Please do post them. We see already some questions coming up, but uh, do post your questions so we uh, continue with uh, the couple of more minutes which is left for, for question parts. Sebastian. Yeah, thank you very much, Miles, for a really excellent talk. And we had a number of um, fantastic talks on the role of CCS in decarbonizing and um, energy and and our environment. I think yours is just another sort of icing on the cake in that, in that list of, of excellent talks. So the first question um, is from Mosina Hosseini Mir. We just get this one up here. It's probably on, on many of our minds. Um, very interesting talk. Why are not many CCS projects being licensed? Where's the main challenge in your view? Is it still geoscience or regulation? I, I think the main problem assistance? is our funding model uh, remains that um, this technology is paid for by public money, either a tax break or um, by uh, some kind of uh, subsidy system or contract for difference, as we use in the UK. And then people look at them and say, well, compared to other ways of reducing emissions, it's expensive. So why should it, well, you know, maybe we're better off spending our money on something else. This will always be the case if the way you look at CCS is just a way of reducing emissions. There's, for, for many years, there's going to be cheaper ways of reducing emissions. What we need to do is to recognize that the true value of CCS is a pathway to decarbonizing fossil fuels. It's, it's only one way to reduce emissions, but it's the only way to stop fossil fuels from causing global warming. And when we recognize that and make it a requirement, a licensing requirement on the industry, as a condition of their license to operate, that they start to dispose of CO2, that's when, and I think only then, we will, will we see um, a, a, an you know, a serious increase in, in activity in this area. As long as we're waiting for the taxpayer to pay for it, I'm afraid we'll wait forever. That's a really good point. And just before I come up with, um, raise the other questions, um, a big discussion at the moment in the North Sea industry is the decommissioning, uh, having all these old facilities. You know, when they're gone, they're gone, and that makes CCS in the North Sea much more technically, much more challenging. On the other hand, there is, I think, the, the cost estimates are roughly for the UK sector alone over 50 billion pounds, of which roughly half of it, I think, is to be paid for by the taxpayer. So there may be something in those economic models that that allow governments to encourage governments to make a contribution. We are currently in the absurd situation that we are subsidizing the industry to take pipes out, knowing that we will have to subsidize them or assuming we will subsidize them to put the pipes back in 10 years time. I mean, it's completely mm. ridiculous. But our government, uh, I don't know whether the Netherlands government is doing anything better and doing better at this. I think Norway is, is, is maybe thinking a bit further ahead. Um, yeah. but, uh, but, but, but all three countries are still thinking of this in terms of how can we pay the industry to do this? We need to change the way we think about this technology. It's like, it's, it's a waste disposal problem. Um, back in the 1950s, um, nuclear waste disposal was seen as something that it was the job of governments to do while the nuclear industry just got on with developing 
um, their technology and generating electricity. The result was a disaster because the industry, of course, had no incentive to manage the amount of waste it produced. It produced far more waste than it needed to. And we never really came up with a sensible solution to the nuclear waste disposal problem. We're in exactly the same situation here. The fossil fuel industry is being encouraged to dig up fossil fuels as fast as they can, sell them as cheap as they can, and somebody else will deal with the CO2. That's got to change. Your question from Vega Shemi, um, and it's along the lines of economics, would be combining CCS with enhanced ore recovery being more attractive, so to somewhat offset the hydrocarbon CO2 Partly at the same time, ignites a market for it. Yeah, I mean, what you need what you need to recognize um, is that we need to be we need to ultimately balance the flow of of carbon out of the Earth's crust with a balancing flow of carbon dioxide back into the Earth's crust. And so, provided that carbon dioxide that's used in enhanced oil recovery stays down there, and it doesn't always, sometimes it comes back out again, and so that's an important condition, then I don't see why you shouldn't count that as, as part of the balancing flow and, and, and use it in, in a regime such as this one. Um, but uh, you've, got to be, you've got to be careful, and that, you know, this is, a, this is a, a way of approaching the problem that minimizes the role of government, but it doesn't make the role of government zero. And, you know, there is still obviously a very important role of government to play here in certifying stored carbon dioxide and making sure that it really is stored permanently and it's not just leaking out again. We have a question from Jonathan Morris. Do you see any interest in this idea from the fossil fuel companies? We've, um, yes, um, certainly when I talk to sort of people at, mid-level you know, engineers in fossil fuel companies, they love this because it would provide them with a certainty. It provides them with a, 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 an operating environment that they can continue to produce their product knowing that they're not destroying the planet. Um, and you know, the, the, these, the people who work in these companies, they, they don't want to destroy the planet. They, 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 want, to, you know, they want to do good, they, they, just like the rest of us. So, so you know, as I say, at the sort of middle level, and, and management and and the engineers, um, they would they would they would love for something like this to happen. At the sort of senior level, um, in terms of the official positions of major oil and gas companies on this kind of initiative, well, as I say, back in 2015, their official position was no, they didn't like it. Um, I don't know what their official position will be this time around, um, but I'm I'm hopeful that uh, things are changing. Certainly, with yeah, you mentioned BP, Repsol. Also, I think Repsol were the first ones who made the announcement that they're going to become carbon neutral, including all their downstream products. Yes, so. Repsol did. But a, a crucial problem that we have at the moment is that oil companies, uh, oil and gas companies, are making these commitments, but sort of retaining the option of uh, achieving decarbonization by planting trees. And I spent a little bit of time in my talk explaining that the numbers just don't add up. Um, and so, you know, for an oil and gas company to say, we're going to decarbonize our fuel, but we're going to do it by planting trees in developing countries, and this is a great initiative, um, it, it, it just, it, you know, in, in the big picture, these numbers just don't stack up. A question from Sarah, um, and thanking you for the talk. Hydrocarbon companies are somewhat being blamed for providing the fossil fuels to harm the climate, perhaps more so than the consumers for actually being oil and gas hungry. Do you support this public perception? Well, uh, I don't think really here it's a matter of blame, but as a matter of responsibility. Um, these companies have the capability to stop their products causing global warming. They could if they had to, they could dispose of one ton of CO2 for every ton of CO2 generated by the products they sell. So um, I think there's a very strong case that they should be given that responsibility. They should be required to do that. And of course, as a result, their products will become much more expensive to the consumer. You can't, you know, the, the, the industry can't magic the money to do this out of nothing. They would have to charge more for the products they sell. And they would probably sell less, but they would still sell fossil fuels. That's for sure. Even with the cost of carbon capture 
and disposal, um, there would be um, there would be still a market out there for some fossil fuels. So I, I'm not so interested in the blame discussion, more in you know where can we best place the responsibility for fixing this problem. And I think at the moment that that responsibility is actually placed by governments at least very squarely on the consumer. And we hear lots of rhetoric about how people have to change the way we live, we have to change the way we heat our homes, we have to change the way we drive our cars and so on. And that this is what the, you know, the discussion tends to be all about. The consumer is relatively powerless as long as fossil fuel companies are still selling unabated fossil carbon, fossil carbon where the, the, the consumer has no option but to dump that CO2 into the atmosphere, then the consumer is not going to be able to solve the climate problem. Thank you. Here's a really, I think, really important question from Kishan Kumar. Um, thank you for the talk. How do you, you think the developing countries should approach um, achieving net zero, considering the scarcity of economic and technological resources and the basic needs to have sustainable energy in the first place? So that's an incredibly important question. Um, and actually, I, I think one of the advantages of this kind of upstream approach that we are describing this carbon take back obligation. By the way, I should have mentioned, um, uh, uh, I know this is a sort of cross North Sea or audience, um, but Marguerite Kuyper in the Netherlands is actually one of the, 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 the key proponents of this carbon take back idea. In fact, I think it was her that came up with the carbon take back obligation name. Um, and uh, uh, one of the, you know, one of the arguments for this kind of upstream uh, policy measure is that it, it fits much better with the aspirations of developing countries than the kind of um, global carbon tax or uh, you know a global emission trading system uh, that people talk about when um, we're you know in, in traditional uh, climate policies. If you if you you know um, if you if you consider what what we're describing here. Um, it's a requirement to increase the fraction of the carbon dioxide generated by the fossil fuels you sell if you're a fossil fuel company or if you use fossil fuels to ensure that the person selling you those fossil fuels has done this um, over time. But it doesn't place any restriction on the actual amount of fossil fuels you consume. And one thing developing countries have always been very clear on is they are not ever, or at least you know, not for the foreseeable future, they are not going to accept absolute limits on the amount of fossil fuels they consume. So this sort of approach might be more acceptable to developing countries because they would look at it and see, okay, if we, if we use fossil fuels in this way, yes, they will get more expensive, but we won't have to accept absolute limits on the amount we consume. Then I think they might see this uh, as, as a, as, as a a, a possible way forward. And of course, for those developing countries that have discovered fossil fuels in their own territory, I mean, we, we hear of more countries finding new fossil fuels all the time, this sort of approach would provide them with a way of selling their fossil fuels without getting caught by climate regulations. So it's, you know, the, the, there could be some support for it, but it is a really important point that, uh, that, that addressing how this would work in developing countries is going to be a challenge, but that applies to every climate, uh, reg, you know, climate con, um, regulatory measure, um, not just not just to this one. I think this one, in fact, in some ways, would be much easier to implement in developing countries than more traditional measures like a carbon price or a cap and trade system. Great, thank you, much. This is a two-part question here from Sevina Derry. Um, just bear with me while I read through this. So again, thanking you for your great talk. How would you describe the structural adjustments, a breakthrough of new and advanced technologies, and also shifts in infrastructure, supply chains, institutions, market regulations are all needed in, across the different sectors? So what is your view on energy? Yeah, I mean, the will, yeah, there will be big discontinuous shifts over the next 30 years in energy markets, both in demand and in supply. Um, and but but none of the, unless so so i suppose of course one thing that would make carbon take back unnecessary would be for us to, to basically discover free energy i mean so 
So if, if, if suddenly energy became completely free, um, then we wouldn't need carbon take back because there would no longer be any incentive to use fossil fuels anywhere in the world for any application. Um, but you know, I, I think that's pretty unlikely. Um, it's pretty unlikely to happen uh, in time uh, for us to sort of suddenly discover free energy between now and 2050. People make very optimistic claims about what might happen to the costs of renewable energy, but it's important to be, to be clear on this. Um, when we compare the costs of renewable energy to the costs of fossil energy, fossil energy still carries a huge element of rent in the typical cost that people pay for their oil, gas, and coal. That means the person who's digging up that energy is making a lot of money simply because they own the well or they own the mine. And in that situation, if there is pressure on the price, the rent holder, don't, they don't stop producing, they just drop the price in order to keep producing as long as they can make any money and any money at all compared to their extraction costs. And you know, I was hearing recently uh, about an entrepreneur in, in Africa, for example, who is uh, literally having to bury thermal coal that he's digging up along with other stuff that he's mining because he can't sell it. So this is a, this is a situation where somebody has negative cost fossil fuels to get rid of. Um, and, and so that, there's a situation where it's going to be very, very hard for breakthroughs in renewable energy to actually outcompete the cost of negative cost coal. There's one further question from Hassan Mahani, and then I do have a question that I want to ask because you asked it to other speakers on CCS in the past, but um, get Hassan and the photo Hassan first. CO2 so is the usual suspect. You asked, how about other global warming gases? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned, I, I like to stress the numbers. I mean, carbon dioxide is 85% or so of the, of, 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 of the warming um, and maybe a smaller percentage of the rate of warming we have at the moment. Um, we, we can stop these other drivers of global warming, uh, like methane is the biggest one, of course. We can stop those drivers causing global warming relatively easily uh, because they're short-lived pollutants, we don't actually have to reduce emissions of methane to zero to stop methane causing global warming. We just have to sort of stop increasing our methane emissions, which is what we're doing at the moment. Um, so that's very important. That's not to belittle methane. It's very important that we do stop causing global warming with methane, but it should be quite easy to do that compared to stopping global warming caused by carbon dioxide. Because to stop carbon dioxide causing global warming, we have to reduce carbon dioxide emissions to net zero. The exception to this um, for other gases, of course, is nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is uh, heavily uh, entwined with the way we produce uh, our food. Um, and it is a very long-lived greenhouse gas like carbon dioxide. And so carbon dioxide, so nitrous oxide is, is another gas where we really have to come up with um, Basically, we have to come up with alternatives, um, other ways um, of, of fertilizing our, our food or um, offset our remaining nitrous oxide uh, uh, emissions with active uh, CO2 removal uh, in order to stop nitrous oxide causing global warming. But it's still, fortunately, nitrous oxide is still a relatively small contributor to the overall picture. Thank you. So as a chair of the Q&A session, I give myself I'm going to re to the last question because I'm really curious to hear your answer. I think Mike Celia was asked that question when one of our first speakers talked about does CCS have a future? And you, you emphatically say yes. And one, one member from the audience said, with the current pandemic and the big economic pressures that we have um, globally, is that going to increase the chances of CCS in the future? Because we sort of, in this point where we try to restart economies in a greener, fairer way, or is it going to decrease the chances? What is I, your view? I, the, 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 the tough answer is I really don't know, because it all depends how we decide to fund CCS going forward. If mm -hmm. in the past CCS has been funded by essentially payments from the taxpayer or sort of, you know, 
closet payments uh, by ratepayers and so on, uh, then I think it'll be very difficult to persuade um, treasuries to continue to make those payments because they will have they, they'll want to build hospitals, they'll want to rebuild the economies, they'll they'll want to do other things with that money. So we need to change the way we think about CCS from just one way of reducing emissions, for which it might be reasonable to say, okay, everybody should pay for that, to very specifically the only way to stop fossil fuels from causing global warming. So anyone who is still involved in producing fossil fuels and in investing in fossil fuel companies or in using fossil fuels should be participating in paying to decarbonize them because we need to do that. It's the only way to make them safe in a net zero world. And in the long term, it's in the interests of the industry itself to decarbonize fossil fuels in this way. If they just carry on using them without developing CCS, then at some point, you know, those I mentioned at the beginning, you know, those countries that are being economically impacted by uh, global warming will, you know, finally not be able to take any more. And the pressure for an immediate ban will get so great that um, suddenly these companies will discover they no longer have a license to operate. So I think in the end, it is in their interest to adopt a policy like this. Um, but at the moment, it sort of seems to be, we seem to be sort of dancing around it a bit and everybody waiting for somebody else to step first. So, but I, you know, I hope with enough encouragement, particularly, you know, if, 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 if people on this call are in contact with, with legislators and with policymakers and with civil servants who are thinking about how to get CCS going, go and look at carbontakeback.org, which sort of gives all the links to the papers behind this talk. Um, and, uh, and really think about this as a, a, a very different way of motivating and paying for CCS going forward into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miles, for a really good talk. Um, I know that a lot of these talk lectures are part of becoming part of um, the online learning that, that we have in the relevant courses across the globe. So hopefully a lot of the future st of the students will watch this and the future decision makers will get inspired by this. So with that, no, thank you again uh, so to the audience for some excellent questions. Hardy, over to you for some last... Thanks a comments. lot. Thank you, uh, Miles, Sebastian, the audience. It was really a joyful uh, discussion uh, uh, session. Uh, I would like to just take the chance, because we are running out of time, to announce our next speaker will be Professor Majid Hassanizadeh from Utrecht University in Netherlands. Uh, Majid will speak about methane leakage from abandoned gas wells. So another topic related to environment. So I'm, we are really pleased that environmental subjects are gaining a lot of momentum. We hope that this would also encourage the public, as Miles mentioned, to motivate the policymakers that we would like a better world, a greener world, and a happier, healthier, especially for the next generations to come. So with that, uh, I would like to wish you all uh, stay happy, healthy, and tuned until next week for yet another geoscience and geoenergy webinar. All the best and bye.